TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. By the time you see this, we won't be, though. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to watch, to continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see a little warning screen just in case. Uh, Twitch.com, obviously, is where you can catch a live stream, watch previous live streams, or get ready for future live streams. Usernames on the bottom of the screen. We also got Patreon. We post five days per week on Patreon. Monday through Friday. If we miss a day, we double up on the next day or do it on Saturday, man. This is under... I went undercover inside Annie. Undercover a and &E NHS in Crisis. Dispatches. Channel 4 documentaries. That's a, that's a lot. That is a lot. All right, talk to me, though. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. True. You said you watched this yesterday. All you had to do was wait a day. You know what I'm saying? After 10 days of training. This is my uniform. Our undercover reporter, Robbie Boyd, is ready for the first shift as a trainee healthcare assistant, known as an HCA. Definitely feeling nervous. Oh my God. I feel scared. How are you guys? The Royal Shrewsbury A and E is one of the most challenged in the. Where is the? Where is the? The camera hidden. NHS. It's over. And what does A and E stand for? Crowded. There are long delays, and the health regulator, the Care Quality Commission, recently demanded action to stop patients being put at risk. Robbie's soon working in one of the busiest areas. Are you happy to sit? It's known as fit to sit where people who are sick and in pain, but for whom there are no beds, are left to spend hours in chairs. I've been here like, I don't know, 15 hours. 15 hours? It's three o'clock this I'm not going to sit here much longer. I'm in pain. I'm not going to try now. Yeah. It's still OK. How long have you been here? Seven hours. You wait till my test results. Robbie discovers that the long waiting times can have potentially life threatening consequences. Bro, somebody been in there since yesterday? Imagine that. Imagine. Y'all don't even gotta probably imagine it. Y'all probably even been through it or know somebody that been in that mug since. Since what's today? Sun Sunday is when I'm recording this. They've been in there since Friday night. That's tough. As they start their shift, Robbie and a colleague discover a woman who says she's waited almost 24 hours. She's a suspected stroke patient who should have urgent care. Stroke patient, 24 Robbie hour rushes week. to call the doctors in the medical team to find out what's happening. Hi there, um, this is Fit Sit. I'm uh, one of the HCAs. I've been asked to call you because we've had a lady um, with suspected stroke. She's been sat now for 24 hours um, in Fit Sit. That's so ridiculous. wondering if you can send someone down. She's not. She's not what? They say they don't know anything about her. She hasn't been referred to them. I've got some bad news. What? She's not been referred to medics. I have a patient who has been here for 24 hours. She's had a suspected stroke. I feel like she's not on our list. That's ridiculous. I feel like the, le the level of communication... I have a patient who has been here for 24 hours. Stop it. The level of communication is tragic in here. Hours. She's had a suspected stroke. This is shocking. I don't have any words to express. It looks like chaos to me there. It just looks like chaos. I'm sorry to say it's unacceptable. 
very much 24 so. hours is too long for a stroke patient. The stroke patient should be seen immediately, I would say, and they should be having a scan within an hour and then referred straight on to the the medical team for either thrombolysis or what, you know, the treatment they would think which is most appropriate for the stroke patient. They say that she's not on their board and not on their list. Yeah. What did that happen to the bloody list? It's a pissing around. Irritates me immensely, this does. This patient, depending on the severity of stroke, may suffer a severe disability which will take away his rest of his life. He may be... No, no cap. If, if, if... If I was the patient and I was sitting there 24 hours, I would want to have... I would have questions. Or if I seen this documentary and I knew that was me sitting there, I'm suing. 100%. Somebody got to feel this wrath. Dependent on people, you may be uh, dependent on care, or in the worst case scenario, not live very long. That's messed up. We escalated it with the nurse in charge. They will see you shortly. And what if undercover buddy wasn't there? That's crazy. As a trainee HCA, Robbie will be shadowing qualified healthcare assistants, learning to help the nurses, and should not be left alone with patients for extended periods. But the A&E department has more patients than it can deal with, and staff are often overwhelmed. Oh, 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 Ghost OTF 17. Appreciate the gift of sub. How many do you cover? What's her name? You know a few shifts in, and Robbie is sent to help a nurse caring for five ill patients in a corridor that's become a makeshift ward. Patients regularly spend 12 hours or more on trolleys in this corridor. Now, that up, that now. Just so you know, it's my third week. Okay, so it's okay with me. So, me and you are all in the same We're in the same boat. Yes. Robbie immediately discovers that on the corridor, she even the most basic care tasks can be compromised, such as blood pressure checks and heart monitoring. There's not enough plug sockets in the corridor. There's not enough equipment. There's no gloves. There's no sink. We can't wash our hands. We have some wipes. So what is the what? Are, what do we think is the problem? Is it like understaffed or not equipped enough, or is the building just too small, or what's going on? Too many people getting hurt? Or, what things do you wear hands? And where is it? You're blocked off from the rest of the department, so it just means that there's no nurses or doctors walking through that area, and it means that the patients kind of get a little bit forgotten about. One of the patients is clearly in distress and in need of urgent pain relief. Sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> The nurse leaves to find pain relief. And so I was then left on my own with not only this woman, but also four other patients. So Robbie, a trainee healthcare assistant, is left alone to care for the patients. Something which should never happen. Word of my dad, I quit. I would not be doing this job. I'm talking day one, I would have, uh-uh. It's too much. I had a patient in agony screaming. I had no idea when pain relief was coming. I, I didn't know what to do. Can we get a diagnosis? <laughs> well, you're doing really, really well. They're getting you pain relief. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Robbie is concerned about the woman's prolonged agony and goes I, in search of help. I don't feel like she's in the right area. Why is she in the hallway? I get what they just told me, but she shouldn't be in the hallway. This is too much noise going on. This is too much agony. Can you help us? This woman is in agony. That's the best. She went to bed with me, she said, I don't know where she is. There's two seconds, I'm just going to find out where this patient is going to see. OK, I've got the lead nurse coming. But no one comes to help. 
In all, it's 20 minutes before the nurse returns with pain relief. I expect you to stay with the patient because there's a lot of things in this office. I've literally left for one minute. Did you cry? Nah, I don't do well with hospitals. I couldn't do this. This job would be too much for me. Talk to him. It's dreadful. It's clearly unacceptable. It's a basic requirement, isn't it? If we go into A&E and we're in pain, it would be really good to, to have our pain managed. That's a, an example that the quality of care is really, is really massively eroded. It's crazy. That poor woman in that pain, it's, it's really upsetting. What we've seen here, there's a whole series of examples which show what happens when you don't have enough capacity in the whole system to look after people properly. You get people in the wrong place, receiving so less good capacity. care, receiving undignified care. Our system urgently needs to increase the amount of capacity, both in space and staff, um, so that we can actually begin to look after our patients properly. I'm pretty sure there's no such shortage on nurses, at least there's not in America. And I, I know y'all need this helicopter pad, but y'all could put a whole nother building here and put the helicopter pad on top of the building. It's the job of A&E to stabilize patients so they can be treated elsewhere in the hospital or discharged. Any delays in assessing and stabilizing patients puts them at risk. Hospital's pretty big too. Hello, you can come to area four. Our undercover reporter, Robbie, often works in the ambulance receiving area. Are you able to get your weight on your feet? Even in early summer, a&E is so overcrowded, patients routinely spend hours waiting in ambulances. That's crazy. Did you have to stay in the ambulance for very long? Two and a half. How long were you in the ambulance for? Oh, from two o'clock to three. I've seen that five at first. Did you have to wait long? Four, four and a half hours. So, so they're having to wait in the ambulance on top of that which is taking possible emergency vehicles off of the road for other things, cases, and things of that nature. So this is a trickling domino effect. It's crazy. Right, yeah, we came to one ambulance, and then they went off shift, so we transferred to another ambulance. They transferred you between ambulances? Transferred, okay. We're meant to take cams over within 15 minutes. Let's have uh, I've had it when I've had 10 outside. 10 ambulances waiting to come in. Does that, like, put the patients at risk? Yeah, it can do. Absolutely. It's a huge problem. You've got to look at this as a whole system. And fundamentally, the problem is that we don't have enough hospital beds and we don't use our hospital beds efficiently. So the end result of that is our hospitals are too full. Most of our hospitals this year have been running at occupancy levels of over 94%. And that Dang. trickles down and causes problems for the emergency departments and the you ambulance. Kicking people out. Once you in good? the receiving yeah. area, patients are meant to be quickly moved on. But the A&E department and the hospital itself often don't have any spare beds. So the ambulance receiving area becomes another makeshift ward. The idea is they'll be in here for 20 minutes. Have blood DCG obs straight into A and E. That's the yeah, that's how it should work. Right. But unfortunately, it's like blocked. The patient comes in, blocked. Hours later, moves, and then the patient comes in. Uh, but the idea is it's quick. But right, but we've had them for yeah. six hours this morning. Some ambulance services limit how long crews will wait with a patient. I feel like this should be one of those situations that go to the top of the list, the top of the to-do list, 
I know y'all don't got money or supposedly don't got money enough funds to build more, but that needs to be a priority. This is. After that, they drop and go, leaving the patient with the A&E staff, no matter how busy they are. They just rolled up for to this one now the same. Like I said, yeah, they just put me there, really outside. Staff are concerned that these rapid handovers can put patients at risk. The nurse will send again. What do you want them to they do? They just leave the notes. It's not dangerous for the patient. Yeah, it is, but it happens all the time. It's not appropriate. If you are a patient, if you are a prime minister, I put you in the dirt. Do you like it? No. Yeah. You see the point? It's not appropriate. This is now the fifth or sixth staff member that has told me that it's dangerous, that it is undignified. Look like they got some construction going on. Dignified. They should stop it. They only know why. They still keep doing it. It's not going to happen at the moment. They're just only waiting. For something to go wrong. They're just only waiting. For something to go wrong. Yeah, this is... I don't know really what to say. <laughs> I'm really shocked to see uh, you know, this footage, it's something I've not heard myself. Patients being just dropped in and just going without a handover. But that's, that's true. It's really concerning. It impacts patient safety. If somebody has been dropped off without a proper handover, then it's a real concern. It's not just a breach, breach of protocol, it's negligence. Yeah, like, yeah. Why ain't nobody suing? <laughs> The number of patients going to A&E is at its highest on record in England, with almost 1.5 million attendances in May alone. In recent years, growing numbers of hospitals have installed fit-to-sit areas in an attempt to reduce pressure on beds. Fit to sit is one of the biggest areas in the department. We have up to 20 patients in this area, and it is basically patients who can walk around and they are fit to sit generally. I will see that. Okay. The national target is to get seen by a doctor and transferred onto a ward or discharged within four hours. But the patients in fit to sit that Robbie speaks to are experiencing waiting times far in excess of that. 24 hours. You know, it's not correct. It's not correct. Which means their medical conditions are not being treated. I feel like in 14 and a half hours, whatever I came there for, it didn't figure itself out. I'm gone. And are at risk of worsening. Latest NHS England figures show that 60% of patients at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospitals Trust wait longer than the four hour target. This is made clear to Robbie and the other trainees at their induction. The first doctor should see them within the first hour of arriving. This doesn't happen, unfortunately. This would be in fantasy hospital of my dreams. <laughs> All patients in A and E could be either Whiskey. admitted or yeah, sent home within three and a half hours of being in the department. And any patient that exceeds four hours is defined as a breach. So you will hear, we all take the Mickey, all the nurses go, Oh my god, the patient's gonna breach. <laughs> Yeah, see, I'm pretty sure if these patients knew that, <laughs> that four-hour thing, I, they'd be raising complaints. They're so used to it. I don't judge your age. I got told seven hours last night. I've been here 23. At 29 hours, it's to sit for anything's happened for it. That's disgusting, cat. Robbie quizzes a senior member of staff about why waiting times are so excessive across the department. Four hours is too long. Are we trying to get them through in under four hours? And these people, bloody hell, like 40 hours, 35 hours. <laughs> is that normal? Yeah, at the moment it is. Really? Why? It's just so moving in the hospital. There's lots of patients there. I bed walking, so they look at something in Where it's not really in any hospitals. It's the rest, okay. So it's not any specifically that are do that's the problem. It's it's the where they're supposed to be going, 
and A and E is just you know first point of contact, so you deal with it. Two days, I think. Your outfit sit for two days. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. So longest flight in forty-six hours, the longest one. Going to be four hours. <laughs> but these people have been in forty-six. Yeah, so we're not hitting any targets. I'd say we have at least like forty breaches a day. Many of the patients waiting in fit to sit for hour upon hour can be seriously ill people. Oh, hang on, we've got a lady. Hey, have some help, please. Hey, help, please. Hey, help, please. Come to the court and onto the side. The risk is that the longer patients wait, the more they well, like right there. That lady, I'm suing 100 percent I went to the hospital, I was fine when I got there. I sat in fit to sit for 42 hours. And by the time I did, I had an episode. But I was here on time. Y'all could have avoided this. I won seven million. Conditions can deteriorate. Can I help you, please, oxygen? Can you get a phone from somebody? I can't, sorry, I can't. I was holding my hand. Can you open your eyes? That's right. Okay. Okay. The Cedarfix. A Freedom of Information request to NHS England by dispatchers found nearly 400,000 patients in England spent more than 24 hours in A&E in the last 12 months. This is a 5% increase on the previous year. This makes people not even want to go in. Hopefully it won't be too long to get her off of this one and onto an actual... Who's this? They made this lady sit 30 hours in the fit and fit, sit and fit to sit? I can tell by her arm that she is elderly. Oh, it was a nice fit to sit. Oh, wow. That's horrible. That's not actually that pretty much it. Yeah. It's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Well. At least this time, bed, not chair. This is low key sad. <laughs> it's dreadful. Um, people waiting just far, far too long. This is almost becoming acceptable now. It's almost like going to sleep and waking up there. Like, where is my breakfast? Where is my lunch? Where is my dinner? Like, I'm hungry. I'm pass. I'm gonna pass out. Like, becoming. Uh, yeah, the standard of care that people expect. Sad to say, I don't think this is exceptional. Say we have at least like 40 breaches a day. That could be any one of a number of hospitals up and down the country, which is absolutely staggering. You know, there's not a single NHS hospital that's meeting the standard for how long patients should wait within four hours. That's how bad things have gotten. To be honest, the clip is scary. It is. In major departments in this country, you're lucky if two thirds of people are seen within four hours. That's how far and how quickly we've fallen. Spending two days in an emergency department is, you know, it's worse than spending two days in an airport lounge. These are people who are sitting on an uncomfortable seat where the lights never go off, there's constant noise, there's constant stress, there's no clear end in sight. People will miss their routine medications, they'll be next to people who can infect them with other diseases. You know, it's just not acceptable. We know that if uh, somebody stays more than eight to 12 hours, that's harmful. And for every 72 people who spend more than eight to 12 hours, there's one additional death. That's crazy. There were upwards of 250 excess deaths each week That's last year. That's insane. People are dying because of this. It needs to be escalated. Like, it needs to be at the top of the to-do list, like I said. It's a whole new level, isn't it, to be fair, this point? Mm -hmm. The Royal Shrewsbury Hospital may be a challenging example of falling care standards, but national statistics show it is a problem across the country. In the NHS in Scotland, A&E's performed Glasgow. slightly better than England and Wales, but they're still under severe pressure. Twenty-eight 
Tony was just such good fun. Hands-on dad, the king of the barbecue. He loved his family. The king, king of the barbecue. King of the barbecue. He loved his family. If anybody ever had a problem, it's always Tony that sorted everybody's problems out. On June the 25th, 20 took really ill. I just knew looking at him that there was something serious wrong. Tony was taken to Glasgow Royal. When we arrived, his stroke was actually missed because he wasn't presenting all the normal symptoms. Even although myself, my daughter, did keep saying Tony thought he'd had a stroke. Although the stroke was initially missed by the triage nurse, he had been admitted to Glasgow Royal under a category which means he should have been seen by someone more senior within an hour. You have to then ask yourself, if he had been seen by somebody more senior, would they have picked it up? But he wasn't. Instead, he was put in a corridor for more than five hours. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I'm suing. If I'm her, I'm suing. There's got to be somebody I can sue. Come on now, y'all didn't, y'all, y'all, the protocol was not followed. It was as if we were invisible. Tony was freezing cold. They had no blankets at all. You're sat there in amongst the sea of people who need help, and you're literally just a number. It's worse than the DMV. Way Just after 10.30, Tony woke up in real distress. I heard my daughter Anthea screaming, and I turned round and I could see Tony having a full-blown stroke, the very thing that he thought he'd been having, and he was told, no, he wasn't. All that time, Tony had not seen a doctor. I don't even know what a full-blown stroke looks like. I never want to see one. Hopefully, God, knock on wood or something, but... but... It seems like it's catastrophic. Only now did one arrive. I don't think I've ever said this before, but he was scared and he didn't want his daughter to see him having a stroke. Eventually, Tony was operated on, but it was too late. I'm suing. He was holding my hand and then he took another... A stroke is when there's not enough oxygen going to the brain, right? Another turn, his eyes just rolled back in his head. And at that point, I knew that... I knew that Tony had died. Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS say they have expressed their deepest sympathies to... I don't want sympathy. I don't want sympathy. I don't want apologies. You know what? I don't really want money, but... Hey, somebody got to pay. Tony's family and have apologised to them. They say they've made improvements. That's not good enough. How could this have happened after lying in a hospital all that time? He slipped through the net. He slipped through the net with the holes that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's no safety net anymore. That's not, there's no such thing. So a stroke is a blocked blood vessel in the brain, which is the effect of lack of oxygen. That's insane. Oh joy, oh joy, and that. <laughs> Four observations, please. If I've been sitting there for X amount of hours and somebody comes out jolly and chipper, I'm going to I'm going to lose it. <laughs> I'm going to look at them like they're crazy. Like are you crazy? Just come over here and straight get to doing work. I don't want no conversation. I don't want no smile. I don't want none of it. I'm done. Back in Shropshire at the Royal Shrewsbury, Robbie is finding more evidence of declining standards of care. I remember I took my daughter to the hospital um when she was like this was when I was still in Chicago, so she was before she was one. And we sat in there. No, 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 no. Was this? Yeah, no, this was before she was one. We, she had a fever. 
We sat in there so long the fever was gone and she was back normal. I was, I'm gone. This is ridiculous. What? I don't think, it, and I don't even think it was four hours. I don't even think it was three hours. I think it was like an hour and a half, two hours, and I was done. I was blue. So uh, I couldn't do this. this Working in fit to sit, Robbie hears a cry for help from a side room across the corridor. A dementia patient has been moved to a side room because he has diarrhea and vomiting. Another patient points out he shouldn't be on his own. Do they realize he'd got dementia and been on his own with the cannula? I think I'll go. Left unsupervised, he's pulled out the cannula tube, which allows for the quick injection of medicine into the bloodstream. So I walk into his side room. And he looks really terrified. His gown's covered in blood, his sheet's covered in blood, the floor is covered in blood, and he's sort of still bleeding from the wound. Why did you pick your panel out? Maybe we can get the chair. I don't know. What do you think? What would happen if there's an emergency? Should he have been on his own? So I go and check with a healthcare assistant what our protocol is for looking after patients with dementia. If a dementia patient has diarrhea and vomiting or something and needs to be isolated. Are you supposed to keep an eye on them? And you, you're supposed to be in the room with them and keep an eye, not leave them on their own. Dementia patients don't have capacity, and so they might fall. They might rip out their cannula. They might harm themselves in another way. They might wander off. And we need to be watching over them to ensure that whilst they're under our duty of care, they're safe. Keep coming. Yeah, that's where we're sitting, in the green chair. Just be careful. Right, tell my son, why would you rip out your cannula? Well, I have dementia. I didn't know what was going on. Get your ISS in here. At a morning meeting, staff are read a warning from a senior manager about care standards in the department. Basic nursing care standards have fallen significantly. There have been a number of official and unofficial complaints from both patients, families, and the wider trust staff around it. People have been found to be wearing incontinent pads um, but are able to ask and to be taken to the toilet and have been told by both trained and untrained people to just do it in the pad. Patients on oxygen have not been monitored appropriately. Patients being left in a state of partial undress and no urgency from staff to address the issue. End of life patients not having appropriate observation. <coughs> patient was found deceased in a cubicle wearing an oxygen mask That's and evidence ridiculous. of vomit around their mouth. All of these are unacceptable and the standards must improve. That's, so what are we doing to improve it then? During the months working there, Robbie documents a catalogue of examples of deeply worrying standards of care. Certain things were being missed or just going under the radar. Notes always seem to be going missing. We can't find a name. Oh, I'll have a look. In busy periods, medications are being missed. Are you guys OK? No, I haven't had a paracetamol since 12 o'clock. And patients are going without eating for hours on end. Have they come round with dinner? Not today. Oh, so you do get food while you sit in this fit to sit. <laughs> it's so busy, you're being asked to do a million things, you're being pulled in every direction. Nurses are getting 15 requests a minute and you cannot keep up. Requests just slip through the cracks. Patients slip through the cracks. I just need to move here very in or in. During Robbie's training, it was emphasized time and again how important it was to move elderly patients using plastic slide sheets to stop damage to their skin. Robbie rarely sees it happen. The coordinating nurse, two other nurses, and a healthcare assistant sort of grabbed the white sheet underneath this patient, yanked him down the bed, and his body sort of slumped over. That's it. It's exactly what we've been told not to do, and they all did it. It just felt very slapdash. When the same thing happens again... That's how you get, like, bed rashes or whatever what they call it. 
I had one of those before when I was in a... Uh, I had to stay in bed for a while because of something. When I got jumped, I had to stay in bed for like a week. And I had those bed sores, whatever they call. Robbie decides to challenge the staff member. Yeah, yeah. especially your side sheets. Yes, very good. It's just all tight. If Gordon Ramsay was in here, this is like... Y'all just cutting corners. Y'all microwaving people. Like, yo, what are y'all doing? Y'all freezing stuff. Like, come on. Let's get some freshness into in here. It's a lot of things. One, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. The time, yeah. to do it the way Perhaps the most concerning drop in A&E standards is the failure to carry out timely observations. For example, of a... Bloody blood pressure pretty high, isn't it? Patient's heart rate. Or is that the heart rate? Well, well that's the part where we currently only complete observations on time for 60% of our patients. The problem is most acute in the fit to sit area. Not to um, freak you guys out, but you are way behind on arms. Why not? <laughs> no. I feel like if you know why you see why are they chilling so tough. I get it, they work in long shifts, blah, 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 and this and this, but this is the job y'all signed up for. I know y'all didn't sign up for it to be so mismanaged, but you got to deal with it. But we can't get up. You haven't quit, so go deal with it. But during the ops every two hours, it is not sustainable. When you've got 30 people, even if you've got commitment, everybody, you've still run out before you go back to oh, the yeah. I find that in here. Absolutely. It is not sustainable. Right. And observations are one of these really basic features of healthcare, whether you're getting enough oxygen in your bloodstream, what your pulse and heart rhythm look like. These, these are the sorts of things you need to know if you're going to manage patient care effectively and minimize risk. Because if you're not doing them, you don't know. You don't know if a patient is deteriorating, particularly in an overcrowded department where you can't physically see all the patients, they're not in front of you. That's just risk building up. Dispatches has discovered that in the last 12 months- I think, it, and I, me personally, if you are fit to sit and you know you leaving patients in there for way longer they, than they supposed to, at minimum, y'all should be doing that, going around every whatever, two hours to check, just to make sure, you know what I'm saying? Coroners in England and Wales have issued 60 prevention of future death reports linked to failings in emergency care. Double the figure for the previous year. In Birmingham. One of Birmingham. them dealt with the case of Tracy Farndon at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Where are you? <laughs> I was very close with my mum. Where's the sign? Where's the sign? There was just this great energy about her that she would just make everyone laugh and feel happy. You got your pretty dress on. Mum was 56. She was fit and healthy. <laughs> Over the course of three days, she had sickness. She started to feel pain in her body. And at that point, her partner drove her. See, man, the body is a scary place, man. You could be good one day, and the next day you'll be down bad. So you got to take care of yourself. That's why I made that change to my diet and eating and, and everything, brother, because I want to live a little longer than on the path I was on. My excuse was always, oh, well, I'm 6'2". I carry my weight well, which I do. But at the same time, I need to get to my target weight healthily. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, the, I want the odds to decrease <laughs> of leaving Earth early. You know what I'm saying? To the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. They were understaffed that evening. Over the course of five hours, there was no observations carried out. That's what I'm talking about, like a minimal 
do the observations because you know you effing up everywhere else. Just do the observations. <laughs> she was crying, screaming in pain, and Mum's partner was literally trying to flag down anyone. He was desperate. See, if I have a wife and she's going through that at some point and nobody's replying, the next male the male the next male worker that walked past, I'm slapping her. That way y'all gotta give me some attention right here. Rather it be police you there has to be an influx of people coming here because at this point I'm getting negative. I'm getting negative. I know you're doing a job, but I got a job to protect my wife. And if it means slapping you, then that's what gotta happen. Oh God, that's what gotta happen. He felt like he wasn't being listened to, he wasn't being heard. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> but this slap will get you heard, I'm telling you. I'm not even joking. Y'all think I'm joking? I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm dead ass. He even started to... And I don't, I don't condone violence, but in situations like this, like... This is ir this is this is triggering a little bit. Watch the monitor. Go back. Literally trying to flag down anyone. He was desperate. He felt like he wasn't being listened to. He wasn't being heard. He even started to watch the monitor himself. Oxygen levels have dropped to eighty three. He's going on Google. Is this okay? Is this normal? This is now six hours. Um, this is the first point that she is reviewed by a doctor. He was shocked that he had received her in such a condition, and at that point, she was transferred to resus. I made my way there and was literally walking across the hospital car park, and I get the call from a nurse to say, you know, you need to get here now. So I'm literally running through the car park to reach her, and I'm being told that you can't go in, she's being resuscitated. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I just spoke to her last night, and now you're telling me she's in cardiac arrest. She looked just like her mom, eh? When they did call me in, uh, it wasn't because there was any activity, it was just to demonstrate that we're stopping CPR now. Did you sue? <laughs> I know that don't help, but... Yeah. Everybody needs to sue, because that way the hospital is going to be held accountable and they're going to be like, yo, we, we hemorrhaging money off the lawsuits. We got to fix it. <laughs> get a chance to say, say goodbye. <laughs> and um I didn't I didn't understand what was going on. Um uh it didn't it didn't make sense. She died from septic shock. Septic shock. With sepsis every minute counts. It's tragic to lose your mom, your best friend, your everything. And then on top of that, to know that she died from something that was treatable. Um, That's and up. that she could have been saved. It makes things a million times harder. Mommy's birthday. Yeah. And you got your little oh, dress on. Oh, you mommy. mommy. University Hospitals Birmingham told dispatchers they offered their deep condolences, I don't adding want they're that. working with their emergency teams to improve the services they provide for patients. They failed her, and this Very happened nice. because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. At the Royal Shrewsbury, the A&E department is getting ready for a walk-around inspection by the Hospital Trust's infection control team. How are you? Trust. Oh, why? <laughs> oh, there's an inspection today. Yes. Ah, OK. So, everything is... I don't know what you guys are. It's just awesome. What, what, you know, so we're able to clean everything that... It's supposed to be... Well, if you was handling stuff right, you wouldn't be stressed. With the Last year, I forgot where I used to work. I used to work somewhere, and they used to do. Ch I think it was Sodexo. I used to work. Yeah, I think it was Sodexo, and they used to come in and do checks and things of that nature. 
And I used to have a coworker, and they'd get so worried. It was I used to work in one area, and they normally worked in another area, but they was working with me on this particular time. And then they was like, "Oh man, I gotta, we gotta do that. I gotta, like it's already done. You see me, I'm stress free, buddy. I don't wait for the last minute. I I do stuff accordingly and in fashion and in line. You're not gonna stress me. I'm not gonna." You know what I'm saying? I'm not one of those people who are going to be hustling and bustling to get it done when I when I had time three, four hours ago and I didn't do it. Like, no. I'm doing it when I got time. And when the time comes, I'm stress-free. You know what I'm saying? I'm always ready, so I ain't got to get ready. You get me. <laughs> yeah, there was a spike in cases of the superbug C. difficile. The hospital has brought down the numbers though it remains a threat. On multiple occasions, staff tell Robbie that hygiene standards are poor. What you experience when you look at it, the commode is dirty. People leave them down to Yeah. If I... They always do it, if they're doing it all the time. So what is the cause of it then? Right. Spread of the... Infection. Yeah. Robbie notices many examples of poor infection control standards. Yeah. Oh, it is dirty. In particular, around how staff clean commodes. So I walk into the sluice, which is kind of like a utility room. And it's a really high infection area because this is where all the patients' urine and feces will get washed away. I see dirty commodes that haven't been cleaned. There's no labelling to say when they've been cleaned. Urine and hair. There was visible feces and urine still on them and they'd just been left. Robbie witnesses another way infections can spread while cleaning beds with another member of staff. Ow. He's put on gloves to clean down the dirty bed. Then moves immediately over to the next patient wearing the same gloves and asks him if he needs anything. You okay? Fresh water. He takes his water wow. bottle, touches the top of his water bottle, wearing the gloves still, and at that point I said, do you think maybe we need to take our gloves off? So we maybe, um... Because we've just gone straight from one patient to another and we're touching something he's about to drink from. I was Well, I was going to say, should we take off the gloves before we fill out the water? And he says to me, oh, yeah, good spot. At this point, Brody needs a whole new pair, a new water bottle, a brand new one. It's too late. Which is pretty alarming. Talk about a good spot. Boy, you don't stop playing with my health. See, me, if I see, I would have seen that, though. Like, as the patient, me personally... I know y'all gonna be like, oh man, you you can yo, you just see every yes, yes, especially when it comes to stuff like that. Absolutely, I would hey hey hey, go take them gloves off, buddy. Uh uh, Let's slow it down. <laughs> Robbie talks to a staff member whose job it is to help ensure the department is kept clean. I was speaking to um, one of the other housekeepers. She was saying there's supposed to be three of you on it. Yes, the race. There's only you. Yes, the race. That's horrible. <laughs> Tell me about it. What does that mean? Like It means you don't get everything done that you're supposed to do. You just clean it. Like, skip, oh. like six. Thank right. You. It's not good. But where's the other two? Why, is the money low? Like That's horrible. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, so that actually I find quite upsetting because actually that's quite a lot of these things, problems are actually avoidable um, and actually employing the right number of cleaners, following the infection control uh, procedures, particularly since we've all just been through a pandemic, should be second nature. Poor infection control exposes vulnerable patients to a potentially lethal environment. 
Are y'all talking about in the chat when I said I would sue? Y'all said, but then at that point, it's you, you against versus the government? No, no, no. It's not me versus the government. It's my lawyer who I have hired who is well-rounded at this stuff versus the government. And at the end of the day, these hospitals know when they fucking up. They know that there's a paper trail, just like everything else in this world. There's a paper trail. Procedures weren't followed, and if you you get to do, you get to doctor in them paper trails, you're losing your license to practice medicine, and this mug might get shut down. So they're not taking them type of risks. That paperwork clearly states on there that I did not come back around here for the next five hours. So as simple as that. I'm suing. Let it be. Let it be my lawyer. Versus the government, and I don't care. However long it needs to take. Out it, but I will ask I for you. Do we have any side rooms free? I will sit. There's a guy who's just had chemo that's in there. That's pretty anxious. I've asked about side room, and they're gonna have a look, but they're not gonna be able to see you. Yeah, I'm gonna need to have a look. But it's very busy at the moment. I'm really sorry. Brody said that and turned around immediately. I'm anxious about seeing that because I think it will discourage somebody who becomes ill from seeking care. Um, people need to know that when they go to the hospital and they are vulnerable to infection, that they will be looked after appropriately. So I'm anxious about that, um, discouraging people who need to seek care, not seeking care. Robbie's back working in the corridor. Hello. What's wrong? <laughs> it's just I'm so glad to speak to somebody. Oh no, why? Well, because I think I'm in danger of being just forgotten there, and I don't know really what's happening. I don't think people know what I'm here for. Robbie has found the care he's been able to offer patients over the last three months has been both rewarding and challenging. Hello. All right. Let's go to the toilet. Okay. We've got somebody in there at the moment that we're dealing with. Can I come and are you going to be able to hold for a minute? That's OK. Yeah, that's fine. We'll sort it out. Yeah, he's in the same position. I'll, I'll be back in one minute. Sorry about that. Of the failings Robbie has documented while working in the Royal Shrewsbury A&E department, perhaps the most upsetting is the erosion of human dignity. You want to go to the toilet? Yeah, then I think it's easier to do a, um... Yeah, A bed man? Robbie fetches a urine bottle for the man and later reflects on the incident in his video diary. It's not right that there's a lack of privacy and having trolleys in the corridor, you know, it doesn't really bode well for patient morale. I like you. Right. Okay, you need to stop. Okay. I was so angry because right there? this man, this poor man, was out in the middle of the corridor having to strip naked and go for a wee in front of all of the other patients, all of the nurses, all of the visitors and people's family. He was completely exposed to all of them whilst he did a pee. And it, it was just, it was awful. Yeah, that, that's, see. This, this is the tough. I'm really sorry that you're in the corridor. Let me get a screen. People are having to go to the toilet in public in the corridor. It's not okay. If that was my family member, I'd be fuming. And that's what's playing in my head. If that was one of my family members, oh my God, once again, we'd be in. We'd be I'm so angry so right bad. now because if that. <laughs> if that was my parent having to pee in a bottle naked in front of 30 people it's so undignified and they're trying to be so sweet and they don't want to be bothered everyone's like oh, I'm being such a nuisance I'm like no you're so unwell you should not be the one apologising <laughs> I'm really 
really sorry that you're in the corridor. How, how can you not be moved by um, witnessing that, yeah, that man in enormous this dis tragic. stress, um, profoundly ill, having to, to pass urine in a, in a corridor? the very most basic standard of care that we should be delivering is, is, is not being delivered. It's clearly unacceptable that people should be cared for in corridors. Clearly unacceptable. The things we've seen here today are clearly not just confined to winter. There is a year-round crisis in emergency care. The next government needs to urgently tackle this. They need to increase the capacity within our hospitals and reform the link between hospitals and social care, or this will get worse. We will see, this will become normal. Yeah, I don't see, <laughs> I agree, yeah. History will not judge our politicians kindly if they try to normalise this very abnormal situation. Why did you think you're coming out? I think the standard of A&E care in England is in about as deep a hole as I've seen in the last 20 years. So whatever government comes in, they have a huge task to recover performance. And I know it's going to take an awful lot of money, billions of pounds, it's going to take an awful lot more staff and an awful lot of focus, and even then, you're really going to be out of push. However bad you think it is, however bad the stats are, it's worse. Now, you've got people dying in A&E departments in England in 2024 that don't need to be dying. And so absolutely, it's a warning to whatever government inherits the NHS next. to differ, it probably is. But I'm not there also. dispute some of what why we dispute some of the claims made it's on video allegedly I don't believe anything the people in charge ever say Y'all let me know if y'all have had any of these experiences in the comment or know somebody. This is uh this is messed up. This is messed up. This is innocent people just trying to be cared for. So this is pulling my it's making it's it's triggering. That's what I'm trying to say. It's triggering. I'm gone. Leave a like and comment.